Welcome everyone to the Bordeaux Blend, where we're blending expert opinions and ideas to help people improve their everyday financial decisions. Today we're talking about private credit, something that is coming up more and more these days. Investors are getting excited, some investors are getting concerned that there's a little bit too much money flowing into the space, a little bit reminiscent of venture capital in 2021. But today to help us shine a little bit of a spotlight on the space, we're talking to David Golub, who's the president of Golub Capital, who is a market-leading and award-winning uh, direct lender in the middle market space, um, who's going to help us understand what is going on, uh, where some of the areas of opportunity and, and in consideration should be uh, for allocating capital to private credit and understanding what that actually means. Most people are just used to stocks, bonds. So what is private credit and why is it worthwhile? Golub Capital has $65 billion of assets under management and are about to celebrate their 30th anniversary this year. So have been through separate mar several market cycles. They've seen a great deal uh, and are really entrenched as a market leader in the private credit space. So hopefully this is worthwhile. Please enjoy this conversation with David Golub. David, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Pleasure to be here with you, Sean. So we have private debt, private credit grabbing a lot of headlines, I think peaking more investor interest. So this may be new to some people, but not new to the institutional investment world, especially. And uh, in particular, Gold Capital celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. So uh, just to start, uh, can you give us maybe a, a quick rundown of what the origin story is, how you started out, what the transition of the firm has been, and how you actually ended up as a, as a leader in this private credit space? Sure. So uh, many of you may know I, I, I run Gallup Capital with my brother, Lawrence. So you know, today, as you pointed out, Sean, everybody and their brother wants to be in private credit, but we're the only brothers who've been doing it for 20 years. So uh, the origin story goes way back. When my brother and I were growing up, uh, my dad was a psychiatrist and my mom was a psychologist. So you know, if you're 10 years old and, and all your parents want to talk about is what you dreamt about last night, you, you, need, you need something for defense. So. Um, <laughs> My joke is that we, we started planning our, 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 our middle market lending empire. The, the truth's a little different. It didn't start all that far back. But in the, in the late 1990s, both Lawrence and I were, were involved in private equity. And we both had the experience of the challenges of doing buyouts at that time. Typically then, your senior lender was a bank. And the bank had all kinds of funny restrictions in what it could do. Um, many of those restrictions were regulatory in nature. And they couldn't lend you as much money as you wanted to borrow. So you typically, in addition to the bank, also arranged a junior loan from an insurance company. They were called mezzanine loans at the time. And the insurance company had their own strange requirements, and some of those were regulatory in nature. So when you started day one of your buyout, you had in place a capital structure that really wasn't geared around the success of the deal. It really wasn't geared around an ability for you to do acquisitions or to grow. The mezzanine lender typically wanted to get paid back the next day and just keep their warrants. And the bank lender wanted to do anything that would prevent them from having to go back to their bank investment committee. So it was a clunky structure. And we started looking at this and, and saw that private equity was growing, that an enormous amount of talent had gone into private equity, that it was generating really attractive returns, that it was likely to continue to grow. And we saw an opportunity to create a firm that was specialized in providing financing for private equity sponsor backed companies. And the core idea that we brought to the table was really simple. The core idea was it was disruptive and simple. It, the core idea was, what if we just did one loan instead of two loans? What if we did what, what's today called a unitron or a one-stop loan? And what if we held it all as a specialty finance 
company. And, and what if in connection with that, we wanted to lend the borrower more money, assuming that it was using it for good, solid reasons and that it was growing and prospering? And what if we had as our goal doing repeat deals with financial sponsors so that we could create this long-term win-win partnership and this cycle of success? So we brought that construct to Gallup Capital in the early 2000s. It was disruptive at the time. All the other players were in this syndication model and had all of these regulatory issues or were selling to lots of other players. Um, and it's interesting how the, the industries develop, Sean. To, today, the model that we brought is the dominant model. And I, I suppose along with that, you know, there's new entrants, obviously, with the, with the amount of assets that are flowing here, people are starting private debt funds all over the place. You have all the way up to, you know, the Gobs are included in that, maybe the Blackstones and the KKRs of the world. How do some of the characteristics of those different market participants change along that spectrum uh, as maybe they increase in size, aside from the obvious things of, you know, kind of experience and track record? Yeah, I think the private credit industries have uh, done what, what most industries do is they go through an adoption curve and they grow and, and they mature. It, it's moved toward a segmentation model. Different uh, uh, firms move in different directions with slightly different strategies. So as you think about that segmentation uh, construct in, in private credit, I, I think the place where we see it most clearly is in the period since 2019. So in 2019, suddenly it became relatively common to see 500 plus million dollar private credit deals. Before then, almost all those larger size financings were done in, in the broadly syndicated market. Suddenly, 2019, we see larger deals start to being done by, by private credit players. And we see attracted to the market some of the names you just, you just talked about, Blackstone and uh, Aries and Owl Rock and HPS and Blue Owl and Apollo and a number of others uh, start moving toward this new BSL replacement market. Um, and we are also a player in that market. It's not a big part of what we do. We've, we've stuck to our knitting in the traditional middle market. Uh, but, but we've seen the development of this, this large BSL replacement market where multi-billion dollar private credit deals are getting done. And you know, I, I think that can be an attractive market segment. I like ours better. I like, I like the traditional middle market better. We can talk about why. Um, but, but it's illustrative of how, from a private equity firm's perspective, just being able to have the choice between a private credit option and a broadly syndicated option, I, I think it's, it's great for them that they have more choices now. Yeah. And maybe to get, so we don't get too far ahead of ourselves just yet, maybe we can contextualize this a little bit better for people, because I think it's one of those things you mentioned private credit or something like that, and people kind of nod and smile, but what does that really mean? Maybe we can use, you know, something more broadly available, you know, your typical bond mutual funds or something like that as an anchor. So people have kind of a reference point for what the primary differences might be in underwriting and portfolio construction, all of those good things. Sure. It's a, it's a really good point because sometimes people mean many different kinds of things by the phrase private credit. When we talk about private credit, we're talking about making loans to companies that are controlled by private equity firms. And there are small companies in that category, you know, companies that, that can be $20 million of EBITDA. And today there can be very large companies with hundreds of millions of dollars of EBITDA. The portion of the market that we focus on is in the 20 to $100 million of EBITDA range. So these are good, solid companies. They're not venture, you know, venture capital kind of companies. They, they have a solid market that they are operating in. They typically have hundreds of millions of dollars of revenues. They typically have a leading market position in the area that they're operating in. Uh, but they're also solidly middle market companies. These are companies that are typically too small to access the high yield bond market or to be public uh, or to access the, the broadly syndicated market where, where banks are, are, are still important players. Um, in essence, we operate at the intersection of two segments, Sean. We operate 
in, in the place where the U.S. middle market is, is relevant. So that's, you know, 200,000 companies. It's a third of the U.S. economy. It's a, it's a really vibrant part of the U.S. economy. And we operate where that intersects with the private equity ecosystem. And as you know, the private equity ecosystem has grown tremendously over the last 30 years. When, when I started in this business, there were 20 private equity firms globally. And you know, today there are thousands of U.S. middle market private equity firms. Uh, and the industry keeps growing. I mean, it's, it's very likely going to double in size over the next five years. It's, it's been a, uh, an extraordinary success story over the last 30 years. And as you're talking about those types of loans, can you help us maybe understand how does liquidity look for something like that compared to other types of companies that may be, as you mentioned, able to access some of the high yield market or other areas of, of the market? When you talk about liquidity, do you mean liquidity for the company as a whole or liquidity for debt or liquidity for debt? So, you know, if you think about the traditional sources of debt capital for American companies until recently, it was banks or it was the corporate debt market. Uh, which is for much larger companies. You have to be much larger than the, the, the middle market to, to be able to access the investment grade corporate debt market. Or high yield, where again, you're typically looking at uh, companies that are hundreds of millions of dollars of EBITDA to be able to access that market. Um, so we're, we're talking about a market where for, for, for most of the companies that we operate, uh, that, that, that we for most of the companies that, that, that we partner with, they don't have a liquid debt option. They don't have the ability to issue traditional fixed income bonds. They don't have the ability to issue high yield bonds. They don't have the, 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 the ability to, to uh, access public credit markets. So that's good for us because you know the, the, the more limited choices that they have, means that there's less competition for our capital. And just kind of going down the list here of, of headlines and questions that we get either from people who this is their first time hearing about it, they're asking questions about it and just redistributing those to, to some of the audience here. But we hear a lot about you know, diversification within this space and the focus on middle market companies. You seem to hear a lot about an emphasis on technology in healthcare sectors specifically. So how do you, can you break down a little bit of that, uh, you know, different environment, ac environment across uh, verticals and different sectors and how that all shakes out, especially as it relates to finding appropriate diversification? Sure. So I'm going to frame this from the perspective of an investor in private credit. So let's put ourselves in the shoes of, of a uh, CIO of, a, of an institution, or, or if it's a, a high net worth individual, the individual, what, what ought they to want in investing in private credit? So the first thing I'd argue they want is a diversified portfolio. Diversification is the only free alpha in the world. Uh, so we like in creating our portfolios to look at position sizes of less than 1%. So typically have a portfolio of loans in excess of 100 different positions in order that we're reducing the, 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 the risks associated with idiosyncratic events. You know, a, a, an obligor operates mostly in Florida and there's a hurricane there. The, these sorts of things are, are not hedgeable other than through diversification. Second thing I would want is I'd want a portfolio of loans to resilient companies. You know, we make money primarily by avoiding losses. So being careful about the kinds of companies that we lend to is, is a very important source of consistent premium returns. So when I talk about resiliency, what I mean is companies that are going to do well even if macroeconomic conditions aren't so good. So we tend to avoid cyclical companies, steel companies, auto companies. Uh, companies that are going to be highly impacted by uh, a recession. Um, areas that fall in the category that we like, you know, companies that, that will do well across a variety of different scenarios include some of the industries you mentioned. So we are 
particularly overweight um, companies that are in the mission critical business to business software sector. It's a sector we've been active in for almost 15 years. It's a sector that's done really well across a variety of different economic conditions. And it's done well for predictable reasons. These are companies that have a product that helps other companies, their customers, be more efficient and more effective. And you know, in good times, every company wants to be more efficient and effective. In bad times, it's really important for, com for companies to become more efficient and effective. So it's not only the case that these companies are, are, are resilient, they're predictably resilient. There's some other sectors where, again, we've found that, that the underlying obligors are, are particularly resilient. An uh, example would be insurance brokerage. Uh, these are firms that get paid a commission for helping their clients have the right kinds of insurance uh, programs in place. They're not taking insurance risk, they're advisors. And because of their relationship with their clients, there's an enormous predictability to their revenue stream. They tend to gain customers year over year. They tend not to lose customers. So they tend to see revenue growth in connection with, 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 with their operation year over year. Other businesses, you know, one of the key questions we ask in underwriting them is what could go wrong? How badly could those things go wrong? And if they went wrong, you know, what would happen? Um, would there still be a strategic acquirer who'd want to own the company at a price high enough so we wouldn't lose money? Um, how, how bad is bad? Those are the sorts of questions we and, and other folks in private credit are always asked. And I think that's a good um, comment that you make in particular about the operating health of the company and their balance sheet. And one of the things that I think attracts people to this, sp this space much more maybe than other forms of debt is that historically there's been a much lower default rate within the space. If you're going to compare that to even some other of the other high yield sectors within that market, which I believe between the two, you know, you can call private credit these days, maybe a 1.6 to $1.7 trillion market, depending on the estimates for who that's roughly about the same as, as high yield. Um, but, you know, are there any other, I think, key considerations relative to that high yield market that you would emphasize or push investors to look at as they think about deploying more money into this space? So another key difference between most of private credit and certainly what we focus on within, within private credit and the high yield market is where you are in the capital structure. So if you think about a capital stack for a typical company, there's you know, equity at the bottom and then there's preferred stock. If there is any, there's, there's junior debt and high yield would, would be an example of a kind of junior debt. And then there's senior debt. Um, and if that senior debt is at the top of the capital structure, it's typically called first lien or first out, uh, and it's typically senior secured. Uh, almost all of what we do via lending is in that first lien senior secured category. What that means in practical terms is that if things don't go so well, we're less likely to get hurt. We're more likely to have a better recovery. and there's just more inherent stability to the value of our positions than there is to, to junior debt like high yield. So as investors are thinking about where they wanna be, I think one of the key questions that they need to ask is, you know, am I getting paid a sufficient premium for the incremental credit risk that I'm taking by lending to less resilient businesses or by lending deeper into the capital structure? Uh, or by or by using a manager who's not so experienced. So th those are you know those are the sorts of questions that that investors need to be focused on. And you mentioned collateralization when you referenced earlier software companies. I think most people often think about tangible assets, equipment, things like that. that they might use as collateral for a technology company or a software company in particular. What might that actually look like? So for us, when we talk about a, a first lien senior secured loan, we're less focused on the security interests that we have in inventory or in receivables. We're more focused on the security interests that we have in the, in, in, in the cash flow and the entity value of the company. 
So again, let's just talk about an example because I think it comes to life with an example. We, we, we might be working with a leading private equity firm buying a, a, a mission critical business to business software firm for you know, 18 times EBITDA. And uh, we would provide a loan that would cover the first six times EBITDA. And the private equity sponsor would be putting in equity that would represent the remaining portion of the capital structure. So in my example, we're lending about a third of the value of the company at the time that the, the buyout firm is making the purchase. Um, and you know, we've got a very thick tranche of, of junior capital underneath us. So the, the company can, in my simple, simple example, the company can have in value, bad things can happen and, and cause the company to be worth only half of what it, it was purchased for. And that's still enough so we don't lose any money. The private equity firm doesn't have a good investment in that scenario, but that's not, you know, that, that, that situation is more their problem than our problem. The flip side is if the company increases in value, we don't benefit from that. The most we can get back is, is the amount that we're investing. So the bargain that we have with the private equity firm is we're providing lower cost capital that's more senior in the capital stack and therefore more secure. And we're going to generate a lower return on that in good case scenarios than the private equity firm who's got, who's got the junior part of the capital structure and captures growth. Can you help us understand and how should people think about worst case scenarios? Because I think that's what a lot of people want to know is, look, I mean, this sounds great, um, makes a lot of sense. I think there's a lot of benefit to partnering with sponsors and private equity backed companies, you know them as operators, how they're running the business. They seem to be very, very good uh, in whatever their, their focus area happens to be. But how do you map out and can you give people an, a, an understanding of what you know, a worst case scenario might look like piggybacking on you know, the 30 year history of the firm uh, and how that's done through these, these you know, bouts of, of market volatility and recessions and things like sure. that? So I want to frame your question first. So we're talking about the Gallup Capital Strategy. So that means we're investing in first lien senior secured debt, top of the capital structure. We're working with resilient companies that are in resilient industries. And we're working with top quality sponsors. I want to spend a minute on that last piece because we haven't really talked about it. And I think it's really important, Sean. There are three reasons why I think working with companies that are owned by top quality sponsors has lower risk. The first is one you just mentioned. Top quality sponsors are good at what they do. They pick good companies. So we start the game looking at making loans to companies that a top quality sponsor has already vetted and said, hey, we think that's a really good company. So there are two parties. There's us and the sponsor who's looking at that, that company in the initial underwriting phase and coming to the conclusion this is a really good, solid company. The second risk mitigant of working with a top quality sponsor is that they're good at improving the performance of their companies. You know, there was a time early in the history of private equity when private equity firms were mostly financial engineers. That's no longer true. They're really good at running companies. They have operating executives. They have teams that are dedicated to procurement. They have uh, playbooks on how to improve the performance of companies in different industries, that value that they bring to the table, that improvement in the operating performance of their companies, that's a credit enhancement for us, right? We are the indirect beneficiary of that value that they're adding in the form of the, the credit support that it provides. And then the third reason is sometimes we're wrong and they're wrong and everything doesn't go swimmingly. It's great to have a top quality sponsor in the mix because they can add more capital or change management or do some other things to turn around a situation that's not going right. So all those things are really important in enabling us to keep our default rate low. Our default rate for 20 years has been you know, less than half the broadly syndicated index, and that's despite the fact that we're lending to smaller companies at wider spreads. Our default rate should be higher than the default rate for this, this index of larger companies, but it's less than half. 
and we've been able to sustain much lower credit losses. So what's that translate into for investors? It's meant that we have you know, very rare quarters where we have losses. Our returns have been very consistent over time. If you look at our, 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 our flagship Gallup Capital Partners Fund Series, you know, we don't have a single bad vintage year fund over the course of the last 20 years. It's, they, they've all been very successful funds. Um, you know, if we have a quarter like the quarter that you know, Bear Stearns went bankrupt or Lehman went bankrupt, we're, we're, we're not going to have a good quarter then, but it's not going to be terrible. And when we do a good job, because our companies actually do a good job of, 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 of continuing to pay us interest in principal when due, uh, you know, the, the performance is, is very strong. So you know, we, we've been able to generate very consistent premium returns year in, year out for 20 years. What do you consider, David, to be, you know, quote unquote, not not a good quarter? I think we had two lost quarters over the last 20 years. I think in the, the worst quarter, we had, you know, something on in, in, in our worst performing funds, we had something akin to a, a, a five to seven percent negative quarter and it bounced right back the, the following two quarters. So, right. you know, you've got to. This is not equities where you can wake up one morning and find that 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 you can have that loss in a day or two. This is very different. Or even 2022 for publicly traded bonds. Most people weren't weren't too happy that when that was their you know primary source of risk management that year. That's right. Um, going back a little bit to the private equity companies and the sponsors that you're working with, there are of course some that really focus on a particular industry or vertical. There are some that are a little bit more broadly distributed. How do you think about working with those different times of, of firms? Is there an emphasis on one versus the other? Um, how do you think about strategically partnering with those folks to make sure that you're getting the best possible access to the right companies that you want uh, to actually be lending to? So it's a great question. We think that um, partnering with top quality firms is a key element in our success story over the last 20 years. Uh, if you look at the data today, there are several thousand U.S. middle market private equity firms. We've done multiple deals over the course of our history. We've done multiple deals with about 200 of them. And that 200 has generated about 90% of our new deal volume every year going back a decade. So think about those, those 200 private equity firms as being our core customers, our repeat customers. How do we pick them? Well, it starts with a judgment that they're partnership oriented. We want firms that are going to approach hiccups the way we approach hiccups. They're going to dig in. They're going to try to fix them. They're going to be part of the solution committee. They're just not going to throw the keys at us and say, hey, this is your problem now. Second element that we look for is firms that have rare problem situations. If they invest in turnarounds and hairy story, story deals, probably not a great client for us. That's not what we do. We recognize that sometimes private equity firms make mistakes and we make mistakes, but we want them to be rare, right? We, we want that to not be the, the, the norm. So uh, we want firms that, that are uh, more focused on singles, doubles, triples, maybe less focused on home runs, and definitely less focused on strikeouts. Third thing we're looking for is firms that are really good at what they do, that have some source of edge, some competitive advantage in the kinds of deals that they pursue. That's important because it's a competitive landscape, private equity. So just um, assuming that every firm is good at every kind of deal, well, they're not. And we know that because we've worked with enough different firms in enough different spaces to see how differently different firms approach situations. So we work hard to try to understand what are firms really good at? What's their sweet spot? And we want to work with portfolio borrowers that are, that are in those firms' sweet spots. Now, all of this requires strong relationships. It's one of the reasons why I think we do so well relative to some of the newcomers. You know, we have very strong, deep relationships that in many, in many cases go back decades where we, we know 
We know the partners, we know the vice presidents, we, we, we know the prior portfolio companies, we know the track record. It puts us in a position to make better decisions. You're not, presumably, working with every single one of every single one of those 200 uh, PE firms portfolio companies. So how many are you typically evaluating kind of throughout the year? Can you give us a sense of what that funnel and process actually looks like? And then as you think about portfolio construction, where do you think that the line is for, you know, both having the right amount of diversification and not being over diversified, if, if that's something that you're considering? So uh, you're absolutely right. We don't say yes to every deal, even with private equity firms that we like. In, in fact, even with our favorite private equity firms, we, we do a, a portion of their deals, not, not even that large a portion. Uh, the reality is that private equity firms don't want to be over-reliant on any one lender. And we, as a, as a lender, don't want to be over-reliant on, on, on any one private equity firm. It's, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about diversification. Diversification is good for, for us and for them. Um, so the, the, the core principle, Sean, that we, uh, that we operate under is we need to be so good at providing debt solutions for private equity firms, portfolio companies, that they want to work with us. And if we're successful at that, we're going to get a look at all or almost all of their deals. And we're then going to be able to use our underwriting expertise, our scale, our, our, our special uh, sauces, is, is, is our ability to make good, good credit decisions. We're going to be able to use that to pick the, the companies to lend to that we think are least likely to get into trouble. And our success at that over two decades, I think, is what's enabled us more than any other single factor to produce good returns for our investors. That is a process. And we typically look at literally thousands of opportunities per year, and we end up doing you know, two to five percent of that. In some years, it's, it's higher. In some years, it's lower. But, you know, it's, it's, it's typically in that range. And, and I think the the size of that range, the small, the smallness of, of, of that percentage gives you, a, gives you a little bit of a sense for how tight the filter is. There, I think, is a huge advantage, likely, in the information flow that you both get from seeing how these companies are operating, even the deals if you're not doing them, just getting some of the insights from these various PE firms who are helping them a great deal kind of navigate what's going on in the world in the time being probably lends itself to some, some great insights with feet on the ground there. So given that there are some prevailing concerns about recession, we heard a lot about that last year, everyone's saying, okay, 2024 is the year. What are you seeing? And from an insight standpoint, um, from the other firms that you're partnering with, how do you feel things are, are shaping up for the year? Are you starting to see kind of cracks in the ground with some of the companies that you're working with? What's, what's your outlook for 2024? So it's, it's a great point. We do have an unusual perch, an unusual vantage point to look at what's going on. And you know, I'll start with some, some context. It's been shocking, and, and I, I use that word advisedly, it's been shocking in this period since COVID began, how wrong consensus has been and how consistently wrong consensus has been. So let's... I'm a big Michael J. Fox fan. Let's go in the, in the DeLorean for a second and, and, and just take a trip back. So April 2020, lockdowns have started. Everyone expects a global recession, maybe depression, and we end up with a boom. Later that year, there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion about inflation. The conventional wisdom, the consensus is overwhelmingly, oh, there may be a little, but it'll be temporary, no big deal. It turns out to be worse than it's been since the 70s. When it got bad, all of team transitory was hiding under their desk. No one was talking about transitory anymore. Everybody was talking about how inflation was going to be stubborn and was going to be around for a long time. Wrong again. It was you know, very policy responsive. And last year, we were kind of having this discussion last year this time. You know, the, the regional bank crisis was just starting. The drumbeat of negativity was just, I mean, it was deafening. Uh, people weren't just talking about recession in 23. They were talking about, you know, how deep is it going to be? How bad? 
And of course, we look back and we say there was no recession, not even remotely close. It was a pretty good growth year. Um, the sign was wrong on the forecasters. It wasn't minus three, it was plus three and change four. Um, so I, I use that all as a, seg, as, as, as a context, Sean, for I think we all need to be pretty humble about predictions these days. We, we've all been so wrong and so consistently wrong that I think we have to recognize that we're in a period that's new. We haven't lived through a pandemic followed by very loose fiscal policy and, and very easy monetary policy. We, no, nobody's got experience with that. There is no, oh, well, this looks like 1973. And, and, and so if we, were, if we were all thinking about this in the language of AI, we'd say we don't have the, the, the history to be able to machine learn. And the out puts of our brains has been pretty interesting. It's been wrong. All right. So having said all that, let me tell you what my take is on where we are right now. The data that we see from the hundreds of companies that we get financial information from, mostly, mostly monthly, says things are continuing to go pretty well. And um, over the course of the last five quarters, we've been reporting in the Gallup Capital Middle Market Report, which we, we publish uh, the first, first few weeks of every quarter, we've been publishing data that says that revenue growth and EBITDA growth has been well stronger than consensus forecast. We most recently uh, published our report for the fourth quarter of 2023 in early January, and you know, we showed an acceleration of revenue and EBITDA growth in Q4. So not only are we not seeing weakness, we're seeing accelerating growth in both revenue and in EBITDA. So as we go into 2024, I think there's some momentum. And this makes me reasonably optimistic that we're not gonna have a near-term recession because we're not seeing the signs. We're not seeing signs in unemployment. You know, The unemployment numbers are remaining low. The jobs numbers continue to be good. Uh, we're not seeing a change in cap spending rates. Uh, we're not seeing a growth in inventories. And most important, we're not seeing margin compression. There are some signs that are worrying. There's some signs of, of growing uh, c consumer debt difficulties, auto loan difficulties. So I don't mean to be painting a picture that's unabashedly positive. I, I think there are some headwinds. Um, but but I don't think there are reasons to to think that we've got a, a recession around the corner. And looking back I, on your just piggybacking on your twenty year operating history here, when you did start to see a little bit of margin compression or impact to capital expenditures and unemployment from portfolio companies, what what was typically the lag in previous cycles when that started to I suppose become more widely accepted knowledge? you know, um, and, and priced into then public equities and in public markets thereafter? Like how much of a lag have you seen from portfolio companies that you're working with getting data on a monthly basis versus, you know, what, what's, what does the edge look like there? So, Sean, I don't recommend that you um, start trading equities based on sure. our data because <laughs> sure. we are pessimists. I mean, we have predicted 19 of the last three recessions. Uh, so I think we tend to look at data and see clouds and see uh, headwinds, e even when that's not the overwhelming conclusion that maybe one should draw from the data. Um, that's in part why I think it's interesting that right now, I'm not sounding so negative. I'm used to being the the doom and gloom voice in the room. And for the last, I don't know, year, a bit more than a year, I, I, I've been in a different place. I've been saying, no, I'm hearing all these voices about doom and gloom, but I'm not seeing it in the data. What are your expectations as in particular, how the private credit landscape is likely to evolve in your opinion? So a couple of points. One, I, I don't think the business cycle is dead. So I'm saying on the one hand, I, I don't see a recession imminent, but you know, 
if we're taking a, a multi-year perspective, a five-year perspective, we're, we're going to have a downturn at some point in that. We've got to plan for it. We've got to, as investors, be ready for it. From a Gallup Capital perspective, that's how we underwrite. When we're looking at new loans, we make an assumption that there's going to be a material macroeconomic weakness within the first couple of years of our loan. And that's the most vulnerable period, right? That's before the company's grown and reduced debt and, and, and improved its debt ratios. So that's that's the first point. The, the second point I'd make is, you know, I, I think the outlook for the private equity industry, and we, we in some respects, are, are driven by the performance of the private equity industry. I think, I think the likelihood is the private equity industry is going to continue to grow significantly during this period. We know that because there's a very large amount of dry powder, of com committed capital to private equity funds that has not yet been spent. And you know, again, different estimates, but order of magnitude $2 trillion. Uh, and Private equity continues to raise capital. They're complaining about it being harder to raise capital, but, but they're continuing to raise capital at a faster rate than they're spending it. So I think we're likely to see significant growth in the private equity ecosystem over the next five years. That's good news for us because those are our customers. That's the pond we're fishing in. So I think private credit's going to see an opportunity to continue to grow um, as, it, as it continues to serve this growing private private equity ecosystem. I think there's an additional benefit for large scale private credit players because private equity firms, the, 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 the private credit players they really want to work with are the large scale ones. If you're a private equity capital markets partner, you don't want to have 40 different relationships. You want to have a half dozen core partnerships with private credit firms that can do a lot of different things for you that are partnership oriented, that have deep expertise, that can grow with your portfolio borrowers. We built Gallup Capital to be, to be you know, uh, checking all of those boxes. And I think there are you know, a couple other well-positioned well private credit firms as well. I think those well-positioned firms are going to gain share. So I'm pretty optimistic about the future of private credit. I think you know, we we're going to see our market grow. We're going to see an opportunity to grow with the market. We're, we're going to see an opportunity to continue to take some share from the broadly syndicated market. And we're going to see particular success for the large scale players in, 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 in growing more rapidly than the industry. And do you think along with those new market entrants, is that at all putting pressure on uh, the deals that you're looking to get done? or um, you know, having some sort of broader impact maybe on you know, returns? Might there be some amount of compression that happens there just by way of new entrants, new capital flowing into the space? Uh, look, we've always had competition. We've never had a private equity firm say, ah, charge us whatever you feel like. I mean, that's, <laughs> not, that's not the business. I mean, in the early 2000s, our key competitor was... Uh, a, a little company called GE, and, and they were pretty tough to compete with because they had a AAA rating and a much lower cost of capital. Um, so you know, we're used to competition. We're not afraid of competition. I mean, it's, it's all about creating a really compelling value proposition for your clients. Yeah, and for whatever it's worth, I mean, it does seem that, as you said, this is becoming something that's a little bit more mainstay. I think people used to think more about, um, you know, from from you know high net worth family standpoint, thinking about stocks and bonds and cash. Maybe they had a little bit of real estate, but it seems the prevailing opinion is that at least this will be something that will be considered much more regularly going forward now. Much less so, just inst institutional capital players, and, and you'll start to see more of you know kind of family office, multifamily office, and retail. Uh, participation within the asset class is that fair? I, I think I think that's I think it's fair across the board. I mean, our roots are in that uh, high net worth uh, wealth management channel. I mean, we started Gallup Capital. We didn't we didn't know how to raise institutional capital. We weren't smart enough to try. So we we focused on the the high net worth wealth management sector. It's still by 
favorite client sector. The, the people there, they, in many cases, have run small businesses, medium-sized businesses. They really understand what we do. Uh, so I, I think you know, what we're seeing is that investors across the board are, are figuring out that this is a segment that they ought to have some exposure to. And they're you know, thinking more and more carefully about, well, how much exposure, how do, I, how do I balance that across a couple of different niches within private credit? How do I optimize from a tax perspective? Um, I think these are all discussions we, we're seeing a lot of these days. With that, David, uh, thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate you coming on and educating everyone about your history, what's going on in the private credit space, and hopefully making it a little bit less opaque out there. Well, it's my pleasure, Sean. Really fun talking to you. Thanks, David.